Nathaniel Rayliff, welcome back to E-Town. It's good to be back. It's really good to see you. Same. Good to hear you too. Hey, I'm trying to think it must have been seven or eight years ago was the last time you're you were on the show? Uh, I think it's been a, it's been a bit of time. Been yeah. a while. Yeah. And uh, a lot has happened in that time. Yeah. I mean, more than I think any of us thought would happen. Um, personally, for me, a lot has changed. And then the world has changed a lot since then, yeah. too. So. Yeah. Speaking of the world change, you just quick check in, COVID, everything's okay with your friends, family, and band, and so on? Um, yeah. Um, everybody in my family and everybody's yeah. been well. Um, there was a couple people that were sick early on. Um, but, um, I might've been sick when we first ended our, yeah. our tour, um, but been tested and don't have the antibody. So who, but who knows right. about that stuff? Let me just um, remind our, our listeners and viewers that, um, the night sweats, it was kind of a side project for you. Right. And, um, around the time we probably last saw each other, it was started percolating, getting a bigger following in Denver and it just exploded. It just turned into a huge thing with good, with good reason. I mean, I have to tell you, I saw your show last year at Red Rocks, Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweats, and it was a spectacular show. And you commanded the stage in yeah, wow, such a great way. It was just, you know, the, the moves, you tossed your electric guitar 40 feet to your tech over on the other side of the stage. I it mean, doesn't always make it over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, yeah, I know you've repaired guitars, so, yeah, you'd be like, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> no, you really, I, and I was thinking as I was watching you, um, I mean, I should, you also open for the Rolling Stones, and you're, you're playing these the football arenas and stuff, but I was thinking as I was watching you, leading a band, putting on that show, uh, commanding the stage in the way you did, and I wondered... Did, when did you learn that you actually could do that? And, or does that maybe come from like your church days with your family back in the Ozarks or where did that come from? Um, well, you know, my, my mom wrote a lot of those songs back in the day. So it wasn't <laughs> quite the scene of like the, the, uh, blues brothers when James Brown is a pastor in that film. I always wanted to be that, but, uh, my mom was a little more on the sort of singer songwriter side. It's so a little yeah. more tame, <laughs> Um, I, I think I kind of had to, I kept trying to learn how to do it. I think, um, when I first wrote the songs for the Night Sweats, I didn't, I didn't even know if I'd be able to like tour and sing at that register without losing my voice every night. And, um, you know, I, I definitely did some changes in my, like I quit smoking and, you know, you can't drink like crazy every day. I mean, you can for a while. Um, but then, you know, it, it all catches up to you. Yeah. And, um. But I think, you know, I just kind of kept pushing myself and the band and, like, to see where we could take everything yeah. um, and, and to see, like, try to figure out what that live experience is. And, and you know, like, you have amazing bands throughout time that you can watch do that and be like, wow, you can get away with that? Well, why don't we try, you know, that or something like that? Yeah. And so it was really just kind of discovery. And sometimes it's hard because... You know, I, I don't think standing in front of anybody has ever made me any less insecure. So sometimes you just feel like clamorously foolish in front of people, you know, and you're like, what am I? Nobody wants to see me dancing or whatever, you know, but. But there's also um, there's probably a little bit of comfort in, in that it's it's still you, but it's kind of an alter ego at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, it's a this is this is a role you're playing and, and there's something very freeing about that. Yeah, and there's, you know, part of that character that is all me. And then there's also parts that I'm just like, you know, like I said, just kind of pushing and discovering. Um, you know, I think that's the, the great thing about rock and roll um, is that it's best when it's about to fall apart. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's this train and it's like, if it just stays on the tracks, you know. And, yeah. and I think sometimes when you're, like, running around stage and... Uh, I remember playing Newport. It was the last time we played Newport, and uh, we were like the guest players. <clears throat> and I remember just at one point, for whatever reason, I just decided to do the splits, which not everybody in the band knew I could do. And so, like, on beat, I just did, like, splits. And there's a photo of my, like, me in full splits, and then my sax player just, like, like 
totally losing it. Like he just to, he's cracking up. Yeah, and he was like, "Oh my god!" He's like, "I could barely keep playing." <laughs> Even after that, he's like, "I had no idea you could do that." I was like, "I didn't either. I didn't know if I was going to rip my pants or <laughs> what was going to happen." I was like, "I knew, you know, something was yeah." But yeah. wow, <laughs> wow, that's that's uh, that's bold. Well, it's there's not a lot of people who get to see both things: the sort of singer songwriter listening rooms and then play in front of you know 50 60 thousand people right in a big stadium opening for the rolling stones that that must have also been just sort of a surreal kind of an experience uh yeah i mean you know just you grow up listening to their music i feel like they've influenced so many different bands and and their influences are huge influences on yeah. me as well and were they uh, nice to you they were we got to meet them and chat with them and charlie came back and Talk to me and Pat about drums, and I was like, "Well, what's that kit you're playing out there?" He's like, "It's my Gretz. I've played it for like 50 years." I was like, "God dang it!" You know, I'm like, "Oh, why didn't I know that?" You know, and uh, you know, but just they were all super nice, and you know, it, it's interesting to see a band like that um, because you know when you're touring all the time, it is definitely like there's a rhythm to your day, and you it, you know even like them saying hi to us was like a portion of the day of like getting you know. But then, like, I knew that, like, Mick had got there, like, hours and hours earlier to, like, he, like, works out every day, like, on site. And it's just, wow. it's impressive, you know, and to see the energy they have. And, you know, it's something to definitely work, work towards, like, you know, your health and mental wellness. And, you know, especially from a band who is, like, historically the bad boys of rock and roll at certain right. times, you know. So. It helps if they're playing football stadiums in that he can always find a place to work out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, I really need an ice bath. Oh, there's an ice <laughs> bath right there. Yeah. So you've had strings in your band before. Mm -hmm. And um, your, your, um, is it a sound you kind of uh, envisioned? It just, it works really well with the acoustic guitar and, and you have a particularly rhythmic way of playing the acoustic guitar. You've got a great right hand. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, it's really just got a lot of bounce and a lot of rhythm in your right hand when you finger pick the guitar. Thanks, man. It's kind of cool to have that steady sustain um the role yeah. um i was pretty happy that my guitar player that studied jazz he really struggles with that picking pattern i was like yes one thing <laughs> you can't do um, um but yeah uh i think for this record in particular you know we had a lot of like mellotron strings and junos and layers of things and and you know um, originally this record we were going to make with Richard Swift, who was our right. producer who Sorry. passed away. Sorry about that. That's loss. all right. Um, so he passed away July 3rd, two years ago. Um, <clears throat> so that a lot of these songs, uh, you know, I'll even tell you more about the next song, which kind of, I, I think our original plan was like when I, the next song I'm going to play is called All or Nothing. And, um, when I first played it for Richard while we were doing the Night Sweats record, um, he was like, man, I love that. He's like, you can't be too Nielsen. And so I think with the strings, what I really wanted to try to go for was um, sort of call back to like, um, or reference like a little touch of Schmielsen in the Night, which is yeah. a great record. And I also thought it was... In, in Nielsen's career, it was a departure from hits he had had. And, um, you know, I think he We're was... We're talking about Harry Nielsen. Correct. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I should have been more direct. Yeah. No, I just I, want to make sure people can, mm -hmm. can, can uh, discover it if they don't know it already. But in a similar sense, this record is sort of a departure from something I was doing that was being successful, so it was a little <laughs> dangerous. Um, but it was what I wanted to do artistically, and yeah. it felt important to me. So, so yeah, you know... I feel like it would have been something that Richard would have wanted to do if we had the opportunity. And really we were just kept, you know, we kept trying to, um, we learned a lot from Richard and we started this record at his studio after he had passed. And, you know, he had helped me buy a lot of the same gear for my studio to kind of, I think sometimes out of laziness so that he could show up and like know that everything was going to sound the same, but we were able to, to come close. Yeah. Um, with that same sound. So the strings were just kind of an addition to, you know, like I said, something that would, uh, yeah. a lot of records we really loved, so. 